Hello, welcome to this History Speaks presentation. My name is Trevor Tutt. I am the curator of exhibits at the St. Joseph Museum, and today we will be talking about the history of the St. Joseph Museum. In a presentation titled Keeping to the Right, I chose that title based on our very first newsletter that was published at the St. Joseph Museum, then the Children's Museum of St. Joseph, and its title refers to Keeping to the Right of the exhibits. That's the flow that the original exhibits had, and we will delve much deeper into that in a few moments. But first I want to look at the history of St. Joseph wanting to have a museum. The desire for museums in America really took off at the turn of the century. You have a lot of scientific advancement, a lot of world travel research being done, anthropological, biological, natural history studies, and so museums began popping up a lot. It's the origin of the Smithsonian, the Fields Museum, all the big organizations that we know today, and St. Joseph was no different. We had several prominent St. Joseph citizens who had traveled the world and who had several collections to their names that they wanted to display to the public. They wanted the public to have access to these artifacts, to learn about the world around them, to learn about St. Joe history and the history of the world. And one of the most prominent members of St. Joseph Society that really pushed for a museum was Harry L. George. You hear us talk a lot about Harry George today. He's probably the largest collector in the St. Joseph Museum collections. Uh, that also has a long, interesting history that we'll get into today. But Harry George's desires for a museum first went public in the early 1910s. Uh, you see this news article is dated 1914, and he's calling for a museum to show off his displays, his collection. Um, that drive continues on for the rest of his life. Um, there's various buildings that he looked into. There was supposed to be a deal made with the school system so that there could be a museum tied in with the schools. That way, students could go straight to the museum, either within the school building or at least the school district building. Um, that school district building obviously was the downtown public library as well. So there were negotiations very early on to get the museum placed in that building. It was already a public space. It was already being utilized for educational purposes. And so it was the perfect spot to start a museum. Uh, the ad club, uh, which became the Chamber of Commerce, was very supportive of this effort, uh, wanted a museum here in town, again, for public access, public education, uh, civic improvements to the city. This is the, the main goal of the museum. There was a bond put forth to the city to vote upon that would have raised enough money to create a museum. Um, it was put forward in 1922, uh, but unfortunately it failed. Uh, Harry George put a lot of his effort into getting that bond to pass. They were hoping to raise $400,000 to construct a museum building. Um, again, it did not succeed, but the dream stayed alive for many years after that. Harry George unfortunately passed away in 1923 after the bond issue failed. Um, his collection was too large to maintain for the family, and so it was sent to Jefferson City in 1924 uh, to be displayed at the State Museum. Fraser Ford, his son-in-law, was the one who loaned those items. He still maintained possession of the collection, and that becomes important in a few years after that. So unfortunately, Harry George was never able to see his hopes of a museum realized in his lifetime, uh, but only a few years later is whenever the Children's Museum is founded. We recognize Oral Andrews as the founder of the St. Joseph Museum. I recently put together the history of the St. Joseph Museum exhibit at the Wyatt Tootle Mansion. You can come visit it to get a bit more detail than what I'm going into today. Um, we have several images of Oral Andrew in that exhibit, as well as the bust that the museum created for her in her honor. Um, Oral Andrews was a natural historian. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Wichita and her master's degree from the University of Kansas. After she graduated, she illustrated the scientific text Freshwater Biology uh, for the Dr. H.B. Ward who was the head of the zoology department at the University of Illinois. 
After the First World War, she taught biological sciences at both St. Joseph Central High School and St. Joseph Junior College. The two organizations were joined as one at that point. Uh, so Oral Andrews was teaching natural sciences in the St. Joe school system in the 1920s. Uh, she was also the head of the Natural Science Club. Uh, and in the spring of 1927, after she had returned from visiting a children's museum in Boston, I believe, uh, she presented the idea of having a museum in town to the Natural Science Club. Uh, the students were very enthusiastic about the idea. Uh, they said, yes, we, we need a museum in town. We want to be the ones to put it together. Um, Oral Andrew said, you guys put it together. I don't want to be involved as much as possible. Um, but once they got the ball rolling, uh, she helped them develop a board and ended up becoming our first curator and director. In that first summer, they signed 22 life members. Those include famous St. Joe names such as John Landis, Dr. F.P. Cronkite, who was the grandfather of Walter Cronkite, Dr. Jacob Geiger, who owned the Geiger Mansion, and Fraser Ford, who, as I mentioned before, was Harry George's son-in-law. Throughout those early years, the Junior College Natural Science Club organized lectures, rummage sales, and cookouts, and all the proceedings of those went to the development of a children's museum. Unfortunately, as is the issue with most museums, uh, it was difficult to locate a space to house the exhibits and the collections, we were hoping to get a brand new building built. The Natural Science Club was raising money with that goal in mind, but to create a building required to house the exhibits they were hoping to do uh, would have cost millions in today's money. There are various plans that rise and fall throughout the years, and we will get into that in a few moments. And we have several homes throughout the history of the museum. So we sort of go about the development of the museum a bit backwards. As I said, Oral Andrews helped formulate the board of directors. That came first. Uh, we, from those lifetime members that I mentioned, the first board was chosen. They include William L. Getz, who was our president. He was also the president of the Getz Brewing Company and son of the founder of the brewing company, M.K. Getz. Uh, the vice president was N.S. Hilliard, founder of the Hilliard Chemical Company. Guy E. Chestnut was our treasurer, and Roland McDonald was the secretary. With that board in place, we filed for incorporation to form a museum on the 5th of December, 1927. So that is technically our founding date. We use 1927 to recognize the founding of the St. Joseph Museum, although at that time we did not have a home location. It would take almost two more years before we finally opened our doors. We recognize the St. Joseph Public Library as our first home location, but as I said before, there were several efforts to create a museum building before that, and during this research I actually found there were two more homes of the St. Joseph Museum prior to the library being available to us. The very first technical museum that we had um, was a display window in the St. Joseph Gas Company, which was located downtown. It provided a small office for the organization to operate out of and put those art artifacts on display through June of 1927. 1927 also saw the completion of the construction of the new city hall, which is the one that's still there today. Uh, it opened in the summer of 27, and they offered the large room in the West Wing to both the Art League and the Children's Museum to create exhibits. Again, it was the hope to create a civic center of education, to utilize a public building to promote education to the St. Joseph community. Throughout the remainder of 1927, however, the Art League began taking more and more of the space. Um, so more and more art was on display, and there was less room for the Children's Museum's exhibits, and so eventually the Children's Museum was on the lookout for another location once more. In 1928, the Chamber of Commerce was putting on the second annual building exposition, which was held at the City Auditorium in April of 28. And the Chamber of Commerce provided exhibit space for the museum to 
raise awareness of its cause and to show the legitimacy and importance of these exhibits to the community. It was a huge success. Everyone loved visiting the exhibits. And again, uh, the mindset of the community was, we really need a museum. We need to help this organization find a location. In 1927, with the construction of City Hall complete, there were several plans put in place to develop Civic Center Park, which is today known as Smith Park, or it's still the Civic Center Park. Um, those include, obviously, the war memorials, which did finally go into place. Um, but in an often cited design plan by Parisian architect M. Jacques Gruber, there was a proposed library and a proposed museum building on the south of the new City Hall. Uh, it would have been on Edmond Street up on the top of the hill there with the memorials leading up to it. Um, the junior college students who again were organizing and running the Children's Museum at the time actually created a model, which you can see here, that would be the design for a potential museum should this plan be enacted. Unfortunately for all of us, uh, this plan never came to fruition. Uh, the St. Joseph Public Library remained in the school district building um, and the St. Joseph Children's Museum was still looking for a home. And it's understandable the cost of building such a uh, museum quality building that would require fire suppression and climate control necessary to run a museum would have been an exponential cost to the St. Joseph public. So similarly with the bond issue failing almost a decade earlier, um, it's easy to see why it was a struggle to get a proper building created for a St. Joseph's Museum. However, due to the success of the exposition at the auditorium, uh, public awareness was raised for the museum, uh, public interest was recognized, and in December of 28, the St. Joseph Public Library provided a space for the Children's Museum to open exhibits in their central library annex. Um, so that's today the downtown library. Uh, the annex is that side building uh, where school district entrance is and the loading dock is at. So that wing was provided for the St. Joseph Museum. In the original plans of the downtown library building that Edmund Eckel created, there is a space for a museum originally planned to be in the basement. So whenever I was researching this, we've been trying to locate the actual location of the museum. Um, so we assumed it was in the basement. But again, those plans were 20, almost 30 years out of date at that time. Um, so again, plans to make a museum have been in place since 1900, um, but they never came to fruition. So whenever we did finally move into the library, it was the annex building that was provided to us. To begin with, we only had one floor. We're still trying to uh, determine where exactly that was, but eventually we expanded that space. Um, so we spent the winter of 28 and 29 designing the space, creating the exhibits, and we had our grand opening on May 20th, 1929. So if you think about it, uh, our founding date is always listed as 1927, um, but honestly, we did not open officially an actual museum space or exhibits until 1929. Uh, from then on out, the museum hosted annual Members' Day celebrations to commemorate the opening on May 20th. Uh, so hopefully we can get back to something like that soon, having a Membership Day or a St. Joseph Museum Day on May 20th, I think would be a really cool um, celebration of our history. So as you can see by the image on the right, we had a lot of stuff back then. Uh, we had a pretty small space to display it. But like I said, there were several prominent St. Joseph citizens with collections that they wanted to show off. Um, originally, whenever the museum was founded, most of these artifacts were placed on loan. The family still maintained the rights to withdraw items. Uh, they still had ownership of their items. They were not donating to the museum as we know it yet. Um, similar to museums today, there are several styles of how a museum operates. Um, one style which is what we operate on today, is to have a collection space where you care for items and artifacts uh, that you're climate controlled. Uh, you keep it dark, you keep it cool, you keep it away from the public so that it can be protected as much as possible. And then you pick and choose which items you put on display 
to support the narrative you're telling in an exhibit uh, to show off certain things for a short amount of period so they're not out in the public uh, being damaged or threatened for a long period of time. Um, the other style of museums which still exist today uh, due to storage space limitations uh, is referred to as a grandma's attic museum uh, where essentially all of the collections is on display at the same time. It's open storage. Uh, anyone who visits the museum sees everything that you have. And this is what we, we started out as because again, um, these aren't items that are going away in collections. We're not storing things for people. We are displaying things for people and all these items are on loan. So as soon as someone loans something to us, it would go on display. We would create an exhibit based on that. So it is in 1929 that the Natural Science Club publishes the first newsletter for the Children's Museum. Uh, and it's that title that I showed in my original slide, uh, Keeping to the Right. And the reason for that title was to direct people through these exhibits. Uh, the narrative flow of the exhibits was to travel along the right side of the wall um, with cases on either side of you. Uh, there isn't quite a rhyme or reason to the narrative, um, but the display cases house things that are of similar type. You have a Native American collection, you have a collection that's specific focus is war memorabilia, um, swords and weaponry and items that would be used during wars. At that time, I remember we haven't had World War II yet, so this is Spanish-American War, uh, Civil War items, and World War I items. Um, in the exhibit today, which I recently put together last year, I tried to mirror that newsletter and put original items that we've had in our collection since the beginning uh, in cases following that same theme. You have min minerals and fossils, you have natural science items, uh, the taxidermy, a lot of that we don't still have. We have new taxidermy um, that was developed through our history and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but a lot of the original taxidermy we don't still have. Those again were loans and probably returned over our history. Um, some of the original donors that we've had were members of the community who were extremely interested in founding a museum back whenever Harry George was. Um, John Logan, um, J.B. Moss, a lot of these big names that you hear. Um, Houston Wyeth was a big collector. He was originally going to donate most of his collection to the library in general. Uh, and so a lot of those items were loaned to the museum whenever we opened. Uh, he passed away in 25, and so his uh, son, William Wyeth, was the one who actually donated his own collection with his father's in 1930. And so we've got a large collection from the Wyeth family. Um, one of my favorite collectors that I like to highlight is Mary Sherwood McNeil. Uh, Mary McNeil was a friend of Harry George and had a similar Native American collection, as well as several items from the Philippines uh, and from Asia through her travels. Um, she was very prominent in trying to help the museum start. And as soon as we had a location, as soon as we had a board, uh, Mary McNeil was instrumental in filling our space, providing those collections. And I would say uh, her collection is comparable to Harry George. And we tend to highlight her collection uh, a lot in our exhibits, especially the ones I put on at the Wyeth Hill Mansion. There's a collector's room within the Harry George exhibit and that's at the Gore Psychiatric Museum right now, uh, titled Lines and Legacy, the History of Harry George. Um, I wanted to make sure that our other collectors were also highlighted in that exhibit as well. Uh, so you'll see several of those. William Wyeth is in there. Um, so a lot of the original donations or loans rather uh, remained in the museum uh, even after those who loaned them passed away. Uh, and so you have a period through the 1950s uh, where we're actually solidifying those loans into donations. Uh, we have the original donation forms. Uh, we have all the information when those things came in, uh, when they were documented, and a lot of the original numbers we still have uh, in our collection today, and we still utilize those items almost 100 years later. One of my favorite items in the St. Joseph Museum is Miss Hyogo. 
in 1924, the United States passed an Immigration Act which forbade immigration from East Asia, which further increased tensions between the United States and Japan. Uh, remember, this is years before Pearl Harbor, but there was this constant tension between the nations. Um, so to counteract this, in 1927, missionary and academic Sidney Gullick uh, developed a program in which he gathered blue-eyed dolls from American children across the country and had them sent to Japanese children during their Hinamatsuri, or doll festival. The doll festival is an annual tradition in Japan. Uh, dolls in Japan hold a very high cultural role. Uh, they're not just toys, they are an art form, uh, they're an educational tool for society. And so Golik had spent time in Japan and understood the importance of dolls to their culture, and so hoped that this would be a sign of goodwill and unity between our two nations. Uh, and the Japanese government appreciated this effort so much that they commissioned doll makers from each of their prefectures to create a Japanese doll representing their location and sent 58 of those dolls to the United States. Each of these dolls was delivered to a museum uh, meant to be on display to educate the public of Japanese culture, the various regions of Japan, uh, the doll making practice, and art form behind it. So one of these dolls was delivered to a museum in Kansas City, uh, and whenever they were delivering it, they realized there's a children's museum that's just starting uh, up in St. Joseph, not too far away. And so Miss Hyogo was sent to our organization and she has been on display since our opening in 1929. Uh, she was delivered as if she were a real person traveling. She has a passport. She has trunks and luggage with all of her items in it. Uh, she has an extensive collection of traveling items with her. Um, and like I said, she has been on display, as far as I know, consistently since we opened, uh, save for a brief return trip to Japan in which she had restoration work done in the 1990s. She's a very important cornerstone exhibit. Um, we utilize her as the introduction to the Doll Museum, uh, which had been at the Glor Psychiatric site until recently. We're starting the transition of moving it to the Y Tootle Mansion. Uh, so Miss Hyogo is on display at the Y Tootle in the history of the St. Joseph Museum exhibit. Uh, where we talk about her history and her origins being one of the original items in our collection. Um, that room will soon expand out uh, to actually talk about the Hinamatsuri Festival, to talk about Japanese culture and Japanese dolls, because um, so we have a long history of collecting those items and telling that history. So we have been at the St. Joseph Public Library since 1929. Uh, from 1934 until 1935, the public library annex was closed to the public to expand the space of the museum and renovate the entire area. Uh, I believe we actually got an extra floor out of this. I know they talked about removing some walls. So from my understanding, it sounds like the entire annex was redeveloped into a larger museum. Again, we were constantly getting loans. We were constantly developing new exhibits. And so we needed more space, as always, with the St. Joseph Museum's history. Um, we utilized two New Deal programs to help us in our expansion. Aid from the Federal Emergency Relief Administration helped us in the construction and renovations of our space. And in 1937, we sought to hire a teacher, curator, and assistance through the Works Progress Administration. With help from the WPA, we were able to increase our staffing, uh, and the museum was able to create more elaborate displays and help the community on educational projects. Many of the models and displays that were created at that time are still in the museum's collections today. As curator exhibits, it's an interesting place to be whether or not these items exist in our exhibits collection or whether they should be part of the collection since they are nearly 100 years old now. Uh, they almost become grandfathered in as museum items 
rather than exhibit pieces or items that could be out on display. Um, so as you can see here, there's several fish. Uh, we actually have those out right now at the Wyatoodle Mansion. Um, there's various models uh, that, again, they were created specifically to go alongside exhibits, and you'll see another example of that pretty soon. Um, but these were created to tie in with the artifacts, to augment the narrative, give a visual representation to help assist visitors uh, in understanding. Uh, so we have a model of an igloo that goes along with the Inuit collection that we have. Uh, we have later on developed a, a headhunter room to go along with some of our artifacts. So, so these displays were uh, capable of being created due to the help of the WPA. Uh, another project in 1942, uh, the museum staff assisted the city in developing a evacuation plan. Uh, we created an actual scale model map of the entire city should uh, nuclear war break out during the Cold War. Um, and so this evacuation plan was developed, um, but eventually funding for that was pulled. I don't know what ever happened to that scale model map, but I'd love to know where it ended up. In 1935, leading up to the renovations at the public library, uh, we sought to change our name. Uh, the board believed that we no longer served the purpose as simply a children's museum, uh, that it was limiting the scope of our audience, and that we needed to be known from then on as the St. Joseph Museum. Uh, so that was the beginning of the name change. It went through a very long process of finally being changed. Uh, the action was actually delayed in court, uh, but it finally took effect in 1939, or so we thought. Um, there was another clerical error that resulted in the issue not being finally settled until 1947. Um, so finally, uh, we were known as the St. Joseph Museum. Uh, today we are the St. Joseph Museums, Inc., and we, we will talk about that here in a few moments as well. Um, but by 1940s, um, we again were running out of space. Uh, we're constantly looking for a new home, um, always fundraising to try to at some point the the dream of building our own building um, but until that time just trying to find a new location and so in 1941 that need for more space grew exponentially with the loan of the Kenyon Painter collection uh, Kenyon Painter was a big game hunter he was a friend of Houston Wyeth and later married Houston's daughter Maud they went on several safaris together. Uh, the Wyeth lion that we have on display at the Wyeth Toodle Mansion was from one of those safaris. And so Kenyon Painter had a large number of taxidermized animals, which were loaned to the museum by his wife, Maud Wyeth Painter, in 1941 after his death in 1940. Um, we are a natural history museum at this time. We have a lot of taxidermized animals. We're talking about the evolution of animals. Um, natural history and so we took the collection and needed more space to display all of it. And that collection remained in our possession for several years. It wasn't until July of 1979 that it was returned. So if you have memories of visiting the St. Joseph Museum you probably saw some of Kenyon Painter's animals on display. Um, we have several examples of the exhibits shown here. Uh, this image is very interesting uh, because it shows Harry Wright, who is one of our staff artists, again hired by the WPA assistants. Uh, he painted several murals for our displays, like I was saying, these projects of augmenting our exhibits. Uh, and this painting is still on display today, but it was commissioned uh, to go alongside the Kenyon Painter collection. Harry Wright would go on to teach several artistic classes through the museum for our programming, uh, raise awareness and funds for the museum. So throughout the summer of 1941, the board was negotiating with the family of A.J. August to purchase his home as the new location for the St. Joseph Museum. Uh, that deal was finalized, and the museum opened at the A.J. August House in January of 1942. That became the second home of the St. Joseph Museum, as we recognize it today. Uh, we have several images of the opening of that building as the museum. Uh, it was very popular. P 
people enjoyed coming to the Edge August house. Um, but again, constant need for expansion, uh, more and more collections coming in, more and more need for exhibit space uh, led to us moving to our third location, the Live Doodle Mansion, which we still own and operate today. Um, the need for expansion this time came due to the reclamation of the Harry George collection from the State Museum in Jefferson City. As early as 1943, the Board of Directors was in negotiation with the family to return the Harry George collection to St. Joseph. Uh, president of the board, who is still William L. Getz at this time, uh, was able to purchase the collection from Fraser Ford, uh, son-in-law of Harry George, uh, and he brought it back to St. Joseph in October of 1944. At that time, again, we didn't have enough space to store everything, and so they were stored in the basement of City Hall, while other items were put on display at the A.J. August house. Uh, so you have a lot of items stored away in a storage space. Again, we didn't have a lot of storage space at the time. Uh, whenever we were at the library, we actually had like a lab developed. Uh, there were plans to purchase the building next door to turn it into a lab. Uh, where we could develop exhibits and have storage space. Um, AJ August House, again, similar plans were put into place with their carriage house slash garage um, to develop that kind of laboratory. But we moved on so quickly that those plans never came to fruition. Um, it wasn't until 1946, whenever Milton Toodle Jr. passed away, that the Wyatt Toodle Mansion came up for sale. Uh, again, William Getz, who purchased the Harry George collection, purchased the Wyatt Toodle Mansion with funds from the M.K. Getz Brewing Company and donated it to the St. Joseph Museum in memory of his father. You'll see several plaques and portraits of William Getz in the mansion today uh, that tell that narrative as well. And we have a very nice portrait of M.K. Getz as well on display. As I always mention during tours of the museum, um, once we moved in, we made it look like a museum. And what that meant for a mid-century museum was laminating the floors, uh, building large cases out from the walls, and painting the ceilings so that they faded away. Uh, the focal point was not meant to be the mansion. It was not a home anymore. It was now a museum. And so it was thought to be modernizing the space uh, creating exhibit displays that were interactive and interesting to the public rather than telling the history of the Wyeth family or the Toodle family or the history of the home itself. Uh, that is a narrative that we have shifted away from. Um, it was in the 1990s that during some repairs, we actually relocated some of the murals on the ceiling. And so the restoration process began first floor today you'll see that the floors have been restored all the original woodwork is still there so the cases have been removed uh, and everything's been restored to the best of our ability so far uh, again it's only about the front half of first floor that's been repaired um, and we rent the space out so we keep everything open on that floor you'll still see remnants of the old museum in the back and the second and third floor where we still have exhibits today um, but it's a continual process. We're always hoping to repair it, and hopefully with the upgrade to the Children's Museum, we will see more of the family history told in the space. We recently opened an exhibit specifically about the Wyeth family using the portraits that we have in our collection. Uh, again, we're always looking for more. If you happen to want to donate your family portraits to the museum, we would be more than welcome to have them. Uh, we have a history of the Toodles in development, so we can talk about the families as they lived there, their importance to St. Joseph society, uh, how they helped develop the town, and the construction and upgrading of the Wyatt Toodle Mansion throughout its history as well. So that's a quick rundown of the history of the St. Joseph Museum, only leading up to the Wyatt Toodle Mansion. Again, we've operated out of the Wyatt Toodle Mansion since 1947 and continue to run it today with new interesting exhibits that we are updating constantly. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we are no longer just the St. Joseph Museum. Uh, we are now recognized as the St. Joseph Museums Incorporated. Um, that process 
can be traced back to another project that William Getz oversaw, which was the renovations of the Pony Express stables. So in 1959, the centennial of the Pony Express was quickly approaching, and so several St. Joseph citizens got together to purchase and restore the original stables. Um, there was a centennial event planned for the park and the stables, uh, and exhibits were put together by the museum to show off in the stables. Uh, since that event was such a success and drew such a crowd, and so many people were interested in the history of the Pony Express, um, the museum began operating a satellite museum in the Pony Express stables. Uh, so for about 40 years there, the St. Joseph Museum operated two sites, the Wyatt Tittle Mansion and the Pony Express Museum. Uh, it wasn't until 1998 that the Pony Express Museum became its own self-sufficient organization. In 1991, Jewel and Geraldine Robinson formed the Neavon Black Archives Museum at the corner of 19th and Messaney Street. This was built in Midtown to serve the community uh, and educate the public of African American history in St. Joseph. Um, by 2001, they could no longer support themselves, and so they asked the St. Joseph Museum to take it on. Uh, their mission is extremely important to St. Joseph community, and so the St. Joseph Museum at the time uh, joined with the Black Archives, and that is the origin of us becoming the St. Joseph Museums Incorporated. Uh, from that point on, we began adding museums underneath our umbrella, still operating out of the Wyatt Tootle Mansion until the Glore Psychiatric Museum asked for our assistance. The Glore Psychiatric Museum started in 1968. It was a project by occupational therapist George Glore. He worked at the State Hospital No. 2, and he was tasked with creating exhibits which depicted the history of mental health tre treatment in America for Mental Health Awareness Week. He constructed the original exhibits, which are still on display today, with the help of patients and staff at the hospital. The exhibits were such a success that the Glore Psychiatric Museum was soon developed to continue that education of mental health treatment. Uh, it became an extremely popular tourist destination to St. Joseph, uh, so whenever funding for the state hospital was cut in the 1990s, uh, it was feared that we would lose that tourist attraction of the Glore Psychiatric Museum. And so again, St. Joseph Museum was called upon, uh, asked if we would take it on, and we did in 2004. Uh, we moved most of our collection storage to the Glore building due to its climate control and stability uh, comparative to the carriage house and the Wyatt Tootle Mansion. Um, so most of our items are over there today. Uh, we also developed several exhibits to uh, add on to the Glore Psychiatric Museum and tell St. Joseph Museum history uh, at that site while continuing to maintain the Wyatt Tootle Mansion. The most recent addition to the St. Joseph Museums, Inc. was the Doll Museum. Uh, the founder of the St. Joseph Museum, Oral Andrews, which I mentioned earlier, uh, passed away in 1964. She was an avid collector of many things throughout her life, including dolls. Uh, but whenever the museum could not accept her extensive doll collection, um, the Society of Memories was formed by a group of her friends with the hopes to purchase as many dolls from her collection as possible at the estate sale. Um, and so they purchased those dolls, and that's how the Doll Museum was founded. Uh, so it's interesting to think about the foundation of both the St. Joseph Children's Museum and the Society of Memories Doll Museum, both originating with Oral Andrews. Um, so again, the Doll Museum took on a lot of dolls throughout their history. They had several locations, but again, with all museums, constant need for expansion, constant need for a new building. Uh, in, in 2011, they asked the St. Joseph Museum to take them on. And so it's a very interesting way that I talk about in the history of the museum exhibit. Um, again, with the origins being Oral Andrews, both of these organizations, and it's almost as if the Doll Museum is coming home to the Children's Museum. 
And so I would like to use that narrative to think about the future of the St. Joseph Museum. Again, this exhibit and this presentation uh, is to talk about that history. You know, we were founded as a children's museum. We were a natural science museum. Uh, we were a St. Joseph Museum. So those are kind of our three pillars, the three mission statements that we focus on. Uh, we took on other organizations, Black Archives Museum, the Galore Psychiatric Museum. So we focus on those narratives as well, tie them back with St. Joseph history. And so it's my hope to get more of the dolls on display at the Wyatt Tootle Mansion um, to kind of go back to that children's museum aspect within that space, um, to use the extensive doll collection we have to talk about various issues. As I mentioned, the origins of the museum is based in that culture of collecting. St. Joseph citizens traveling the world, collecting artifacts as they travel, and a large part of our doll collection are international dolls. Um, these are cultural dolls which are used to educate the public of cultural dress, cultural practices of various societies across the world. And so there's potential there to actually talk about these different nations, these different peoples, these different cultures uh, through the context of a doll museum uh, and talking about how those dolls made their way to St. Joseph and what purpose they can serve now that they're here. Um, similarly, with the Native American collections, with the Asian collections that we have, making sure that we use those collections to educate the public of other cultures, of other belief systems that might be foreign to them. Along with those themes, we're also maintaining the idea of the Wyatt Mansion being a space to talk about the architecture of St. Joseph. We have amazing buildings in town. We have the extensive E.J. Eccle collection, uh, blueprints of most of the historic buildings around town. Uh, he constructed the Wyatt Tootle Mansion, so we talk about him in the mansion. Uh, and creating fun and interesting ways for kids to approach architecture, uh, get that education, learn what interests them. Uh, so if they happen to like geometry or mathematics or various skills that lend themselves to architecture and hopefully we can spark that creativity within them, uh, get their imagination running and apply skills that they learn as kids to career paths as adults. That's the goal that I have with developing the Children's Museum, which I believe is the same goal that Oral Andrews and the junior college students had in mind was to use collections to educate and inspire kids towards career paths as adults. Along with the architectural and doll-based exhibits that we're putting together, we're also doing the family exhibits. Um, we're also looking at those natural history elements that we have. Again, we were founded as a natural history museum. We have tons of taxidermy. We have a lot of items from nature, fossils, coral. Um, currently, we have the waterways traveling exhibit from the Smithsonian Institute. It will be here through August, so make sure to come by and check us out. Um, it tells the importance of water to human culture, our interactions with it, um, and that's a theme that we already had in place at the Wild Tootle Mansion with our Flood of 1993 exhibit called Confluence. Um, that's still on third floor at the Wyatt Tootle Mansion, so again, feel free to visit us. We will be updating more and more, talking about water, talking about nature, life, animals, um, using the Children's Museum to kind of reinterpret that space and the collections that we have to make sure that we are utilizing it the best way possible. We're also maintaining the history of St. Joseph through the Wyatt Tootle Mansion, talking about the rivers being a way of transportation, um, the importance of transportation to the development of St. Joseph as a central business location during the 1800s, uh, the kind of rise of St. Joseph as a important city in American culture, um, talking about those famous families here in town, uh, famous figures that are often forgotten or missed in historical research. Uh, so the Wyatt Tootle Mansion 
is soon to become sort of the central focal point of St. Joe history. And we hope that you'll visit us soon. If you have any questions, my contact information is here. I hope this has been informative and interesting. I um, hope this has created a better picture of the history of the St. Joseph Museum, where we've come from, and hopefully where we're heading to in the future. Thank you.